Super. All right, well, good afternoon. My name is Lynn Livingston. I'm a member of the Local Arrangements Committee um, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, this is a little bit of a different session where we will be um, showing a um, a pre-recorded video of six presentations. Um, and then um, the very last of those presentations will be from um, our team from the Library of Congress who are actually on this call and will be available for Q&A uh, at the end. So we'll have a good chunk of time, probably about 25 to 30 minutes for you to uh, ask questions of that Library of Congress group. Um, and as you've heard in all the rest of your sessions, we'll do Q&A through the chat function um, here the whole time. Camera off though. Um, so if there's anything you need, please chat. Um, I will say though that um, the, the collection of the um, recordings audio varies between them. Um, so I'm going to, so if, if you need it louder or, or anything, please just shout at me through the chat. I'm gonna, we've tested it. I'm gonna start it off a little bit louder um, for this first recording, but as I need to make adjustments, please let me know. So without further ado, I think I will get this thing started. Let me turn my volume up a little bit so you can hear it. It's just, it's a little bit muffled. So hopefully you can adjust on your end to hear it pretty clearly. All right, and I think we'll get started. Thanks again for being here and enjoy. Oh. Hello, and welcome to our panel presentation, Navigating the Lockdown, Methods of Continuing Archival Work During the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is Zach Stein. I'm the Head of Special Collections at Edith Garland Dupre Library. and a Louisiana room that includes books, maps, microphone, and vertical files. At the time of the lockdown, there were only four staff members, myself, a reference archivist, digitization archivist, and an archives assistant. At the time that we were, so as far as closing is concerned, uh, Dupre Library officially closed on March 24th, 2020, which was around the same time that other institutions of Louisiana had closed. Um, and around this time, and this time, library personnel were sent home uh, to telework. Before being sent home, uh, the university's provost office uh, sent forms that we were required to sign. Uh, this included uh, acknowledging a teleworking policy, uh, basically. Uh, basically outlining what our duties were while we were working from home and a remote office checklist, which um, basically we had to check off of what we were, what kinds of things we needed or had uh, at home, including uh, the number of days we would be uh, working from home, uh, what kind of office setup we had, what kind of computer, what kind of security we had, and what possible, and what also what storage uh, we had as well. We had to check that off and sign that. Additionally, each uh, library department uh, was uh, asked by our dean's office to draft a teleworking and continuity plan. Uh, so these include a list of different tasks that we were expected to do and also uh, what time of day we would be completing these tasks. For example, doing um, uh, training or professional development uh, from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, uh, doing processing work from 11 to 3. We were also asked to come up with a collaborative list of backup personnel. Uh, this was in case uh, there were any um, any uh, uh, librarians were unable to uh, do their work. Uh, there would be somebody from a different department who would be able to take over uh, that work. Now, when it came to uh, actual recommendations uh, for archivists about um, about working uh, during the pandemic. There was actually a list that went around. Uh, it was a Google Doc and made available by the, uh, by the Society of Ar um, American Archivists of a, a list of different activities 
that archivists can consider working on. And these can include a wide variety, such as uh, working on uh, professional development, training, um, ramping up uh, social media, and also documenting uh, different archival experiences during uh, the pandemic. What was interesting, however, is the act of actually processing uh, collections remotely was conspicuously absent from this list. Uh, and this was also the case um, in many virtual uh, get togethers uh, that I had with other archivists. They, many of them seem to discourage uh, bringing home collections uh, for various reasons that I will actually uh, go into later when talking about disadvantages. Uh, for, however, for uh, our special collections department, we uh, were actually more limited in our options, especially considering we only had four staff members and two of them in particular um, didn't have a whole lot of work to do. One, our archives assistant mostly works on uh, processing collections and our reference archivist usually works on Louisiana room items, which were very difficult to work on at home. So in this case, really processing was um, one of the only options as far as teleworking was concerned. So with that, um, we decided to include uh, processing uh, collections in our uh, telecommuting plan. Uh, we did receive uh, approval from our uh, dean's from our library dean's office, and with that, um, each staff member, including myself, we brought home uh, usually at the start one medium-sized collection. So this would be a collection of just around maybe. Uh, four to maybe four to six boxes worth. Uh, and we also brought home uh, different supplies, the typical supplies that we would work on while processing, including uh, acid-free folders, boxes, staples, uh, plastic paper clips, et cetera. And when we ran out of these items, we would let the Dean's office know that we were um, bringing, taking more items out. And when we got back, we would let them know what, uh, what item we would let them know the exact items that we were bringing back as well. Um, as far as as far as how I uh, did this, I would spend usually half of the day uh, working on processing, and then at the other half of the day on other projects such as creating lib guides, uh, research, writing, etc. Um, usually, when finished um, with uh, processing a collection, we would then bring uh, the entire collection back to the archives and then just pull another one. And of course, uh, whenever we had to go to uh, the archives, it would, usually would only be for a limited amount of time, we would notify the Dean's office. And we would also include what collections we were working on in our weekly progress reports, which were sent to me and then which I sent to uh, my uh, immediate supervisor, which is the Assistant Dean of Technical Services. Uh, this is a this is an example of a collection that was worked on at home. This actually is my living uh, my living room table, and interestingly, this was a collection that had been uh, sitting on our shelf for quite a long time. And by bringing it home to collection, I was by bringing it home to process, I was actually able to devote uh, a lot of time just to this. And now, uh, this particular collection, the Elizabeth Brandon Papers, is now uh, freely available. Uh, in our archives and our finding aid is now available online. And that goes into uh, what's uh, some of the, the advantages of uh, working from home. Uh, the, fir the first big one is that it gave uh, staff uh, tasks to work on. Like I said before, uh, a couple of our um, uh, staff members really only had um, uh, processing collections uh, as part of their job duties. And so this allowed them to uh, continue with their work. It also helped with some of um, with some of the other uh, staff members who perhaps could only work on site, ha could only do certain uh, duties on site. This gave them something to work on as well. In addition, uh, bringing collections home really helped us de decrease our backlog. Um, during the period during the period of the lockdown, we were able to successfully process eight fully unprocessed collections and eighteen additions. Uh, to collections as well, and these were often and these were often collections, both manuscript and uh, university archives, uh, that hadn't really been dealt with for a long time. So this gave us a chance to to revisit those. And additionally, uh, because we were given so much time and we had a flexible schedule, it allowed us to work on these uh, uh, collections uh, with our full concentration and without with very few uh, distractions. 
Now, of course, there are some disadvantages when it comes to processing from home. The first is certainly the less than ideal uh, environments. For our archival materials, you need to have a consistent temperature and humidity, which may or may not always be the case when working from home, especially when it comes to uh, air conditioning and if it affects your uh, utilities bill. Uh, and also considering Louisiana is uh, t does tend to be storm uh, storm prone, uh, there could be problems if uh, a bad storm or a hurricane came around. Luckily, the lockdown was during a period where we weren't um, in like hurricane season or anything. Um, then we came, and then another disadvantage could be security. Now this is the case with really any anywhere, but uh, and we also we always assume that uh, homes are that our homes are safe. However, uh, sometimes in, uh, if it's not in, if a collection is not necessarily in a locked area, uh, it could be at risk of security. And there's also a case if you're bringing uh, collections with sensitive information home. Uh, for this, we were actually very careful um, to bring collections home that didn't that we knew did not contain sensitive information. Uh, we wouldn't bring home student records or uh, materials that we knew had social security numbers. If we did come across materials that did have sensitive information, we went about um, our usual redacting process, including photocopying, redacting, shredding, and then bringing the original back to the archives uh, to keep in the control folder. Uh, another disadvantage uh, was certainly um, a risk of infestation and contamination. Uh, one of the box, uh, a couple of the boxes that I did bring home it turned out had uh, silverfish in them. Uh, the way to work around that, however, was we put the um, materials in bags, throw the boxes out, and bring the uh, and bring the bags back to the archives for freezing. These were left in the freezers for 72 hours and then left out to thaw for uh, 20 for another 24 hours. This way, we were able to continue uh, with our processing. So with moving forward, we found that um, all in all, processing at home actually did prove to be beneficial. As uh, discussed before, uh, it allowed us staff to keep working and it allowed us to address uh, different collections that hadn't been looked at for a long time. In addition, we were, we were able to uh, process while keeping uh, certain risks at mind. Uh, as I stated before, we did have a process with regards to redacting and a process with dealing with uh, certain kinds of infestation. Basically, our main, the main bottom line that we did as far as justifying um, processing at home is that we made sure that the staff stayed busy and that our archives could stay true to our mission, which is to process collections that preserve and make accessible uh, the history of the Acadiana region. This is my contact information. Uh, I thank you very much for listening to this presentation, and uh, now I and now I um, give you over to the next presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Jones and I'm Interim Head of Technical Services at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I will be speaking today about how UNLV Special Collections has approached receiving and starting a two-year NEH processing grant in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. I will describe how we have planned and started a project like this remotely and adjusted workflows to adapt to new protocols now that we are working on site. Then I will go over a few major lessons learned from this unique experience. UNLV Special Collections and Archives was notified in April 2020 that we were awarded a $217,000 two-year National Endowment for the Humanities grant to process the Howard Hughes motion picture papers held by the UNLV Film Department. This grant is for one full-time project archivist, two part-time processing assistants, and four students, and myself acting as the project manager. It was scheduled to begin in June 2020, but we were allowed to postpone it a few months while we figured out a way forward, and we delayed until September. At this time, the UNLV campus was closed due to the pandemic, and all staff were working remotely. However, the grant was awarded, and we were delighted to accept it, uh, but since it is a physical processing grant, that work had to be done on site. The libraries granted us special permission to bring the small team back on site to do that work. 
information about the virus was changing very quickly. Uh, so our COVID-19 protocols were also constantly changing and we had to adapt as we went along and it was kind of tough to keep up at points. While working remotely, I began recruiting for the full-time and part-time archival processing assistants and conducted those interviews virtually. I also set up the administrative framework for the project, like time tracking for project staff, initial supply orders, and the collection survey framework that the team would perform. At this point, I had never seen the collection material in person and without access to that collection, all of this was set up based on a few dozen photographs that I had and information I could glean from the grant application itself. Beginning in June 2020, I began working on site part time to help physically prepare for the grant to begin. And the collection needed to be physically relocated across campus. The 400 foot collection was located in the film department's basement and some of it had to be carefully packed and moved by hand due to the fragile nature of the material. I coordinated with the library's space manager and contracted movers to move the rest of the collection, which was mostly in filing cabinets and banker's boxes in a socially distanced manner. And this was not an easy task and it was also done on the hottest day of the year. The three archival assistants were hired and onboarded remotely. Um, unfortunately, the nature of this project is entirely physical, and so there is no remote work in order to comply with the grant. However, I had them do a small amount of remote work at the beginning, uh, doing background research on Howard Hughes and the film production process and things like that in order to familiarize themselves with the collection. Since they're spending two years processing this in detail, all of this work will help them better understand how to best arrange and describe those materials. And I was still the only person on site at this time and began preparing the physical project space for the team. And this meant distancing work tables. Everything had to be six feet apart, uh, designating quarantine stations, posting signage. And normally we share things like pencils, erasers and processing tools, but um, no longer the case. I had to make sure all seven staff had their own individual stations to comply with the protocols. Beginning in September 2020, the project began and myself and the three processing assistants were on site full time working under COVID-19 protocols. The first task for the team was to perform a collection inventory and create a spreadsheet um, of the collection material. And typically this would be a really collaborative team task, but it had to be done individually so the team could stay distanced and quarantine their materials. Combining it at the, all, at the end was a bit messy because everyone performed the work slightly differently, but it worked out in the end. And after virtual interviews, the four students began on site uh, a month later in October. And their training was extensive. And normally we do training in big groups, but due to um, them having to stagger their schedule to meet room occupancy guidelines, um, this had to be done multiple times and the trainers were training from a social distance, which was quite difficult. So now I will share some lessons learned. Um, going with the flow is definitely the biggest one. This is my first time managing a grant project. So on top of the normal learning curve, managing during this chaotic time has certainly been challenging. Um, in order to meet room occupancy requirements for COVID, staff has had to stagger their schedules. And this means that there is little to no overlap for some of the project team. So we've spent a great deal of time communicating and catching up with each other on the project because of this gap. The team uses Slack, emails, and Airtable to communicate project progress. And this was difficult for some at the beginning who weren't used to such virtual communication, but now it works really well. And in the past, casual conversations or quick questions have happened, you know, in the hallways, at desks, but we're trying to limit those interactions. So we have more formal meetings than we would normally have. Socially distanced processing is slower and there are more mistakes, which are really just miscommunications because people process things differently. Um, and that has meant redoing some work, but it's part of the process and learning to accept that is part of the progress or part of the process as well. Uh, COVID-19 has also presented some unavoidable rules that must be followed, which we're all familiar with like masks, staggering schedules, quarantining items, and no more fun things like potlucks or birthday donuts. 
Um, so keeping the team morale up has been another challenge of managing this grant. Without normal routines and those small daily interactions, it can be tough to stay motivated. But now that the team has had time to adjust to working under all of these precautions and workflow changes, they've adjusted really well and are now just doing work like they normally would and are processing the collection. And all of these precautions and adjustments are now routine. And I'm really proud of the project team. And the final challenge that I'll mention has been administering the grant itself. Um, our state had budget cuts and mandated that grant staff also take furlough days. And so this meant communicating with the NEH representative, rewriting parts of the budget, and telling part-time grant staff that they also have to take unpaid time off in a very tough year. So going with the flow has absolutely been our motto this last year, um, whether we wanted to or not. Um, we have kept adapting and changing our expectations. And I want to close by acknowledging the team that we've assembled and say how well they have handled this project. Everyone is doing a phenomenal job and it was a tough start um, for everybody, but we are on track and we are now ready for whatever comes next. So thank you for listening today and please feel free to contact me directly at the email address provided in the slide if you have any questions. Hi, my name is Rachel Sneeze and I'm the Digital Projects Coordinator at Georgia State University. And I'm here to talk about taking the holistic approach, how COVID-19 changed oral history processing at Georgia State University. First, I'm gonna give you some information about the oral history program. Oral history is a responsibility of two departments, special collections and archives and digital projects, a subunit of digital library services, also known as library IT. Special collections and archives are responsible for conducting oral histories and accessioning oral histories from our donors and community partners. Digital Projects is responsible for processing and making the oral histories available online in our digital collections. The library started collecting oral histories in the 1980s, and to date, we have over 950 oral histories. Of those 950 plus, less than 50% of them are available online. Just to give further context, the previous digital staff, digital project staff, left the library in September of 2019. I started in May 2020 in the midst of remote working. The information I have gathered from the previous way of doing oral histories come from documentation converse, and conversations with various people involved in the process. Some of the oral history processing work is done by our GRAs, also known as our graduate research assistants. The flow chart on the right outlines the oral history processing workflow as it used to be. The highlighted portions represent the responsibilities of our GRAs. They also did some video editing and conversion when necessary, though that is not highlighted in the chart. A bit more about the process prior to COVID-19. Projects came to digital projects as a collective whole. When special collections and archives have all of the oral histories for a collection, then they transferred it to digital projects where we kept track of them using a spreadsheet on a closed server. We also emailed the archivist once the project as a whole is completed. Any communication about the oral histories was generally done verbally. This is an example of the of a tracking spreadsheet. Since everyone was in the office, communication again was very verbal. The digital project staff could walk over to check in with our GRAs, and the GRAs could come get a digital project staff if there was a question. There's no need for a robot for a robust notes section, as you can see in this tracking sheet. When COVID-19 hit, all the oral history processing ended since no one was in the office and there was no digital project staff to oversee the transition at the beginning of quarantine. All oral history work was transferred to creating transcripts for oral histories that didn't previously have one. When I started, I knew I had to get the program restarted for the fall, then it couldn't continue as it did prior since we had to take into consideration COVID-19 concerns. I had to make sure to have a plan in case the university shut down again, if someone got COVID-19, if someone had to go into quarantine because they might have been exposed, or if they weren't feeling well and as a safety precaution, they had to stay home. All of which, in these scenarios, they would be working remote. We also had to factor in social distancing, so our GRAs were never in the office together and generally didn't have a chance to communicate in person. Other considerations were technological. 
What limitations existed when the GRAs did work from home? How powerful of a laptop did they have? How much data for internet do they have? How fast of internet do they have? What software can we give them to work with from a licensing standpoint? We also had a we also had communication limitations since we could no longer just wander wander over if we had a question. Something else we had to take in consi into consideration was the fact that we had a massive oral history backlog. Oral histories were still being conducted, though they were by no means complete as a collection. Transcriptions were being done on a case by case basis and not as a collection as a whole. And there were also collections that were never finished prior to the other staff members leaving in order to get the program restarted i knew i had to shift our focus and change the way we look at oral histories instead of looking at oral histories as separate collections we are now going to look at them as individuals and focus on the content type as a whole this means we'll take oral histories on as they come instead of just waiting for the collective whole we also needed to create new communication channels and workflows that would provide the flexibility we needed to accommodate the sudden need for remote work. The first thing I did was to expand the responsibilities of the GRAs. The new responsibilities are outlined in red. I included AV editing as their sole responsibility, obtained permission for them to upload YouTube instead of waiting for a digital project staff members to do it and to create metadata and upload items within our digital asset management platform. This allowed for more balance um, of work that could be done in the office versus remote. That way the GRAs when they were in the office could do large batches of oral histories up to a certain point that they can save for later in case they had to remote, work remote at a later date. At any given time, they would have work to be done in both scenarios. We also shifted away from using tracking sheets to using Microsoft Teams. This video gives a tour of how we organized our team. We utilize posts for announcements and anything that we need to bring immediate attention to. Our processing notebook, which is hosted within OneNote, is a major part of our team. This is a place for graduate research assistants to document new, easier ways to do things, how to overcome any issues when working remote, any tips or tricks they found, and to utilize as their own personal work log. Well, no, also functions as a library for reference guides for not workflow things like how to use planner, our manual, and a step-by-step -step guide for each part of the workflow. This is also the first place to check when our oral, when our GRAs have any issues while working remotely and when I am not readily accessible. We also need to keep track of projects within planner, which is built into Teams. Each bucket represents a collection. Each card represents an oral history. We have chest checklists to track the work and a comment section where I can give feedback when doing quality control. The GRAs get notification as soon as I submit feedback so they can work on it in real time if necessary. Some of the things we've learned from this. During COVID-19 and going forward, flexibility is incredibly important, especially for our graduate research assistants who do not get equipment from the library. We also learned that having extensive documentation for each of our oral histories while still keeping the communication channels in real time has been incredibly helpful. We have things that we can go back and reference, and we know when something was added instead of just a, when was this added? Do I still need to do this? Um, and GRA burnout has been reduced. Some oral histories contain heavy emotional topics that do, that do take their toll on the mental health of our graduate research assistants. By having the ability to switch to a whole new collection and work on different oral histories at any given time, this allows them to avoid burnout and to take care of their mental health. So that's it for me. If you have any questions or want to know more about what we're doing for oral history, you can email me at r-s-e-n-e-s-e -E -E at gsu.edu. Hello, my name is Kay and I'm the records manager for Commander Navy Installation Command at the Department of the Navy in DC. Uh, and because I work for the Navy, the views expressed here 
are mine and mine alone and do not reflect the official policy or position of the U.S. Navy, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. For situational awareness, I started the day they sent everyone home. Previously, I worked across the street as a Navy archivist. I knew for about a month that I'd be starting a new job with CNIC, and I had spent most of February full of nerves and expectations about the new job. However, I could have never imagined that they would send me home on my first day. Like others have mentioned, I was given a telework agreement to sign, and then I was sent home with a laptop. The concept of end state is used in the military, but I find that it can apply to pretty much anything, and I use it all the time. You cannot complete your objective if you don't have a clear vision of your end state. And I will fully admit that I failed to have a clear end state uh, of working from home in the beginning I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't have any long-term goals because tomorrow I'm going to go back into the office and tomorrow things will be normal and tomorrow this will be over and I never envisioned this lasting more than a few days. For situational awareness, I worked in corporate America before I worked at the Navy and I worked from home four days a week. So I am familiar with how to do it, but somehow, like many, I felt pretty lost the first few days. It took about two weeks to snap out of it and to figure out a work from home schedule. I cannot stress the importance of actually leaving your workspace, especially when home and work are the same thing. I realize that it's probably impossible, but I'm pretty sure the walls would start closing in on me after three or four days straight at home. I also realized that I felt better mentally if I worked if I went for a lunchtime walk or an after work walk. The working from home wasn't the issue because I had done it before. It was the 24 seven being at home without the opportunity to go out to dinner or see friends or whatever. For me, time became a lie. Days mean nothing. I'm still not sure what day it is or even what year it is at this point. Everything is just, is just bleeding together. And I realized that I'm beyond incredibly fortunate. I have a job when many have lost their job and I generally don't have any quote unquote real problems. However, this made me very conscious that we're all experiencing the lockdown differently. We're all dealing with a once in a lifetime event. You just never know what the person on the other side of the email is going through. Obviously, please and thank you are very basic common courtesies but I found myself trying to include them in each and every email. I always include thank you for something specific or even thank you for your time. I appreciate X, again, something specific. And I think being specific is important because it helps make it more meaningful. I value the insights and guidance you provided. Thank you for reaching out, but I'm in a meeting for the rest of the day. I'll respond to your email first thing tomorrow. I found that these simple gestures go a long way. We all love to hate video conferencing, but as a new employee, having those body language clues is so important. I'm not sure you realize how much you depend on them when you're dealing with new folks. And I realize this might sound funny, but for the first few weeks, I was questioning what does okay mean? Because I, as a new employee, I lacked context. I can understand folks not wanting to use video conferencing or maybe feel that an email is sufficient but especially when dealing with new employees, I think it's a good way to build team cohesion. I know that these video conference calls help me feel part of the team and I valued them. No one, and I mean no one, including myself, wants to see a photo and email. And I firmly believe that if I ever saw this in any of my previous jobs, I would be like, why? I do not need to see your face. Um, but as a new employee, I really liked being able to put a face to a name and I found so much value in it that I too now am one of those people. While working from home, I was able to launch a records management channel in Teams and build out our records management SharePoint site. I created and provided different training sessions and uploaded fact sheets, flyers, and other resources to our SharePoint site. And in most cases, I was producing these resources from scratch. As others have mentioned, I took all of the online training and webinars that I could find, and it really helped to break up the monotony of working from home. 
and from the comfort of my home, I spearheaded the removal of 15% of duplicate files on our shared drive. And I'm currently working on standard file naming conventions. Well, I'm trying to enforce standard file naming conventions. And I'm also trying to work or trying to figure out how to record trainings and post them to our G2 site. Walking in and saying, okay, folks, this is how we're gonna do things never works. And it really doesn't work from home. I spent the first few weeks and months discussing records management realities with pretty much anyone that would talk to me because even when folks acknowledge that change is positive or rational, change still involves a loss and uncertainty. Once I identified opportunities for change, I look for role models. A scene I see is spread out globally and it's important to have more than one person share and communicate information about records management, services, resources, issues, and compliance. At the HQ level, so in DC, we have what is called, or what we call records management liaisons, and those are representatives from each department. Uh, at the locations outside of DC or outside of HQ, we have regional records managers that I work with as well. We meet every other month, and I provide training and guidance for both, group, for both groups. I started out small uh, and I started to work with just these folks to build trust and understanding. About six months into the lockdown, I started using every vehicle possible to constantly communicate the new vision of the future for records management. I'm constantly saying in meetings, on the phone, in email, in the future, I think it's important to generate short-term wins and that big push to remove duplicate files from our share drive is definitely a win. We had never done anything like this before. So I think the removal of 15% is a win. Building upon that win, we're going to spend the rest of 2021 working on and updating file plans at the HQ and regional levels. All of May, I'm doing file plan training via Teams and we're also now looking at how our files are organized on the share drive, doing some moving of files, renaming folders, and are creating new folders. Currently, the majority of the work is being done from home, so we're just focusing on digital records. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to any questions you have in the discussion. Thank you. Exhibits in the time of COVID going hashtag digital presented by Sharon Wolf CA from Northwestern State University of Louisiana. In March of 2020, Louisiana went into a statewide lockdown. The Cammie G. Henry Research Center, the archive and special collections for NSULA, closed its doors to the public. When the archivists went back to work, we decided to find a way to bring the research center to the people. This is the display area of the Cami G. Henry Research Center's reading room. Normally, I design and install an exhibit that is available to the public about every semester. But with COVID, even once we returned to work and the building opened, the research center was severely limiting our patrons and our doors were closed to the casual viewer. So the exhibit space was inaccessible. I happen to be on the Watson Library Social Media Committee. So I decided to turn to the internet the Watson Library is active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest, so I made a plan around a digital exhibit using those platforms. The first step was to take stock of what each platform has to offer and what the limitations of each are. Facebook and Pinterest, for example, are both designed to group photos together. Twitter and Instagram, though both designed to share pictures, do not. Twitter also has a character limit that includes spaces and hashtags, but Facebook and Pinterest do not allow for multiple pictures per description. The first thing to determine was the time frame I wanted to work with them. Our exhibits are usually up for a semester, so I plan for posting every Tuesday and Thursday for about three months. This gave me the ability to balance how many posts I needed to make with how long I wanted the exhibit to last. I knew I would have to consider copyright in a way I don't normally have to with physical exhibits, and that I would need to watermark the images I decided to use. The character limit on Twitter meant that I decided to pre-write all the descriptions for the exhibit so I knew it would be postable when the time came, and I needed a pithy hashtag that was both descriptive of the exhibit and worked with the limit. 
Once I started posting, I realized I had another consideration, alt text. Alt text is designed so that if an image doesn't load or if someone is using a screen reader, there is a description of a picture that is supposed to be there. Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram all have alt text built into their posting. Facebook is the only one that's not. Consider using alt text to make your content more accessible. At the time of presenting, I have created four digital exhibits and executed three, but for the sake of this presentation, I will focus on the first two that I did. One represents a teaching or learning focus exhibit, while the other a more visual approach. The first exhibit I posted ran from June 30th to August 31st and was titled Picture Show 2020. The theme was North Louisiana in the movies and featured archive material that had to do with Hollywood. Pictured here is Ruth Cross, an author whose book was turned into a movie, location scouting shot for Steel Magnolias, which was filmed on location in Natchitoches, and behind the scenes shot from Horse Soldiers, which was also partially filmed in the Cane River area. The eagle-eyed will notice that the cemetery shot did not make it into the exhibit. It was due to be posted the day after Hurricane Laura made landfall, and I decided that putting it up would be in poor taste. To get an idea of what each platform offers, take a look at one post on all the sites. From left to right, we have Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. Notice how Instagram automatically crops the image into a square. I had to move the watermark on this image when I realized the autocrop cut it off. A caveat before I get into these numbers, I have not found a way to get the impression numbers from Instagram. Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest all allow a user to see how many people have seen a post, even if they didn't directly interact with it. All four obviously show audience interactions, such as liking, pinning, retweeting, etc., which is why the second column is there for comparison. Obviously, Twitter is the highest that I am aware of in terms of visibility. Instagram also, unsurprisingly, was the highest in terms of actual interaction. For Outside In, I took a different approach. This exhibit was designed to showcase the photography of one person from our collections, photographer B.A. Cohen. The exhibit ran from September 2nd to November 24th and featured outdoor photography. I deliberately chose a seasonal theme so that as the exhibit went on, it moved from spring to summer to fall to winter as they are pictured here from left to right. Here again, you can see what a post looked like on each platform from left to right, Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Here, the label was simply photo by B.A. Cohen and the hashtag, so I did not have to plan the descriptions in advance to get around the character limit for Twitter. Here, Twitter is still the number one for visibility, but Pinterest takes the obvious lead for interactions. I suspect this is due to the subject of the exhibit being prime Pinterest bait in terms of simple and pretty pictures of flowers and leaves, but as I only have the one data point, it could be a fluke. Comparing the two, it's obvious that although they come out similarly for interactions, thanks to Pinterest, there was a noticeable drop for visibility overall. My theory is that while the photography focus exhibit was good for primarily image-based sites, Pinterest and to a lesser extent Instagram, the best way to generate interest is by having material that engages the viewer. Find these exhibits and the other two I created focusing on Mardi Gras and the different aspects of Louisiana history using these hashtags and handles. Thanks for listening. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for Team Building During a Pandemic or How We Learn to Stop Worrying and Embrace Failure, processing the Roger L. Stevens papers at the Library of Congress. I am Morgan Stevens Garman, and I am joined by my Stevens Project teammates, Monica Hurd, Anita Weber, and Melissa Young. Before we begin, a disclaimer. We are employees of the Library of Congress, a federal agency, but the opinions expressed in this presentation are our own and do not necessarily represent the views of the library or the United States government. We also want to acknowledge that we live and work on the stolen land of the Nachitonk, Piscataway, Kanoi, Manahoac, and Patawomec nations. We benefit from the land we reside on, and we are committed to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit. It is our responsibility to proactively reverse the effects of white supremacy, genocide, and racism in our institutions. This acknowledgement is only the first step. The Roger L. Stevens papers at the Library of Congress document the life and activities of theatrical producer, real estate executive, and arts administrator, Roger Lacey Stevens 
But who was Stevens? You may not have heard of him, but you've definitely heard of his work. Born and raised in the Detroit area, Stevens, a college dropout, started his own real estate firm in the mid-1930s. Real estate was how Stevens made his money, but theater was how he spent it. Stevens began supporting and investing in local productions before turning his producing ambitions to New York. He produced over 100 Broadway shows, including the original productions of West Side Story, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and the early plays of Harold Pinter. Stevens was also active in the Democratic National Party, and when President John F. Kennedy sought to found a National Center for the Arts in DC, he looked to Stevens to make it happen. Stevens served for 27 years as the founding chairman of what was eventually named the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. President Johnson appointed him the founding chairman of the National Council of the Arts. The Stevens Papers came to the Library of Congress in a series of acquisitions between 1994 and 2004. The initial gifts came from Stevens, but after he passed away in 1998, his wife Christine donated additional material. The collection measures approximately 315 linear feet, some 259,875 items, documenting nearly every aspect of Stevens' personal and professional life, including files on theatrical productions, work with the Kennedy Center and political involvement, through awards and honors, correspondence, office files, personal papers, photographs, and extensive documentation on major real estate transactions across the country. The collection also includes material on Christine Stevens, who founded the Animal Welfare Institute and was a major advocate for the production and care, protection and care of animals. Stevens was involved in a lot of different projects across multiple fields, and the collection's size and topical breadth reflect that. Now that you have a better sense of who Stevens was, we'll give you a sense of who we are, the team assigned to process his papers. My name is Morgan Stevens Garman. My pronouns are she and her. I am one of the project co-leads for the Stevens team. I joined the music division as an archivist in August 2019. Prior to coming to the library, I worked as a somewhat lone arranger, and I had limited experience with archival processing as a group. I am Monica Hurd, and I am an archives processing technician. I joined the music division in the July of 2019 during my second year of the library. Before coming to the music division, I worked at the ISSN Center at the Library of Congress and as a research librarian in Prince William County, Virginia. I had limited archive processing experience outside of graduate school, internships, and volunteer work, but I've always enjoyed working in groups, so I was eager about the music division's processing team's approach. I'm Anita Weber, the other project co-lead. I had several stints as a temporary processing archivist in the music division for four years before becoming full-time in 2019. Over my career, I worked mainly as a loan arranger, occasionally was part of a team, and for 10 years was a manager with dozens of direct reports. I am Melissa Young. I am a senior processing technician. I have 17 years processing experience here in the music division and five years previous experience as a cataloging technician and other areas here at the Library of Congress. As you can see, the four of us came to this project with different backgrounds and different levels of experience in the profession and at the library. We didn't know each other that well. By the beginning of March 2020, we were all assigned to the Stevens Project with Morgan and me as the co-leads. Roughly three-fifths of the material had been partially processed and rehoused by previous Music Division staff, but little descriptive information existed. We needed to determine if that structure would hold and how the unprocessed material would fit in. Morgan and I began our initial survey of the collection and we had our first meeting as a team. At that meeting, we gave a very cursory overview of who, who Stevens was and what was in the collection. There was so much about him that we still didn't know ourselves and so much we didn't know about each other. None of us had worked together before and at least two of us were still within our first year of working at the museum in the music division. Because of the size of the collection, we knew this project would take some time. We planned to meet regularly as a team to keep everyone informed of the project's many different parts and set the tone for group engagement, even if we weren't quite sure what that would look like. Morgan and I prepared a preliminary processing plan, which we presented to the division's processing committee on Monday, March 16th. At that point, 
We knew telework was in our future, but we thought it might be for only a couple of weeks at most. The library closed to the public on Friday, March 13th, and by Tuesday, March 17th, all of us were in maximum telework, instructed not to return to the building until informed otherwise. When we left the building, I was the only Stevens team member who had a library issued laptop. Two team members were able to connect to the library's network using their own devices, and one team member was cut off completely, unable to access even email. Connectivity varied depending on the day. As the weeks unfolded, my laptop proved a crucial connection to accessing documents on the library's shared drive and also using the library's electronic databases available only through VPN connection. Anita and Morgan took home copies of existing inventories of Stevens materials, spreadsheets with their survey and inventory data, and a copy of an unfinished biography on Stevens, as well as their notes and a copy of the newly approved preliminary processing plan. They intended to do background research. None of us knew how long we would be away from the building. We initially thought we would be working offsite only through the month of March. It quickly became apparent that we were not going back anytime soon and that maximum telework would last an unforeseeable amount of time. The Stevens team began to meet virtually in April. Our first check-in was through Zoom, but we later transitioned to the library's approved platform WebEx, and then to Skype for business. Like most people pre-pandemic, none of us had much experience with virtual meetings. We went through the learning curve together. Each meeting began with a check-in, the first question always being, how are you doing? This simple throwaway question before the pandemic took on a new significance with all of us, staying at home, uncertain about what the future would bring. The maximum telework situation gave us all a rare opportunity to do deep dives into our subject matter and also to get to know each other better through sharing the different ways we connected with Stevens's work. Early on, we read and discussed biographical material on Stevens that Monica found using her library laptop to access resources. Then we branched out. Before leaving the building, I photocopied some early inventories of the collection, including a list of theatrical productions associated with Stevens. As Morgan and I were searching for ways to work with the material from a distance, we hit on converting these documents into usable and legible spreadsheet. I scanned the lists, we created instructions, and Melissa took the, on the task of transferring the information. We still didn't have reliable access to the library's share drive, so we used Google Drive as a temporary way to share PDFs with Melissa. Melissa's list gave us a path to further discussion about Roger. We each picked a production to research and report back on it in our now weekly virtual meetings. Another learning opportunity came when PBS broadcast and streamed a recent production of Leonard Bernstein's Mass. The work opened the Kennedy Center in 1971 and thus was intimately connected to Stevens's role in the Kennedy Center as the founding chairman. We all watched the piece and discussed it at our next meeting. In late May, the library announced its plan for phased reopening and we started to prepare for the partial return of on-site activities. We knew all of the team members would not be going back as part of phase one and those of us that did return would only be on site a few days a week. By this time, we all had library issued laptops and were able to connect to the shared drive. Morgan and I identified hybrid projects that could be done on site and via telework. With such limited time spent with the materials before the library's closure, we still needed to get a complete picture of the collection's current organization. One way to do that was through container lists. There were approximately 100 linear feet of real estate material labeled and in boxes. A container list of this material would help provide insight into the next steps, but we didn't want to have a team member spending all their time on site typing up this list. So we came up with a hybrid approach. Morgan would spend a small amount of her on site time photographing the folders in each box. She would send the photos to Melissa who in her telework time would transfer the information to a usable spreadsheet. This was a totally new workflow for our division. Just like with the theatrical productions list transfer, we carefully created step-by-step -step instructions and went over them at the next team meeting. We had a plan for when we were able to return to work and we were confident the plan would work. 
It didn't work. We were allowed back into the building on a part-time basis starting July 20th, six weeks after the library announced reopening. I was able to take pictures of the real estate folders quickly and easily, but uploading them to the library's shared drive proved time intensive. There also continued to be connectivity issues. Melissa wasn't always able to access the shared drive. Another factor we didn't consider was that she would have both the image file and the spreadsheet open on the same very small laptop screen. We spent so much time thinking through the instructions and making sure the process all made sense, but when it got down to it, we hadn't anticipated all of the challenges. Thankfully, Melissa brought the issues to our attention almost immediately. It was taking so much time and the drop VPN connection kept interrupting the work making it much harder to establish a flow. I thought there has to be a better way. So I reached out to Morgan and we talked it through. We decided it made sense to move the work back to Google Drive, which didn't require any connection to the library's network. Morgan was able to upload the photos to Google Drive folder at a much faster rate, and I was able to access them on my personal device while entering the information on my library laptop. It made the process smoother and I got the project done a lot more quickly. This wasn't the last time a carefully thought out set of directions worked better in theory than in practice. As we negotiated splitting our time between on-site work and telework, we were reminded that thinking about the practicalities of a specific task was different than actually doing it. But because the communication structures were there, thanks to our weekly check-ins, and we were able to quickly address each new issue and pivot to a better work plan. The telework time also gave us the opportunity to cultivate new skills. Personally, through my research into Stephen's life, I gained a better familiarity with the library's electronic resources and online databases. I had never really had the occasion to use them extensively before. To find specific articles for the team, I quickly learned how to navigate the databases and search them effectively. Other team members became more familiar with Google Docs, Excel, and the particular quirks of connecting via the library's VPN. We also dealt more with the library's online catalog, doing in-depth searches for published books found in Stephen's collection, and adapted to email as opposed to speaking face-to-face -face as a primary source of everyday communication. Maximum telework lasted 18 weeks total, and we were back on site in phase one for five weeks before the library moved to phase two on August 24th. In phase two, we are all, all now spending at least some time on site each week. All of us are able to interact with the Stevens material and processing the connect collection could begin in earnest with the start of the second phase. We could also finally meet in person, masked face to masked face. We continued to have weekly meetings in phase two. The idea that we would stop our regular check-ins now that all of us could be in the building didn't even occur to us. In phase two, we were each actively involved in processing some aspect of the collection and solid communication was even more important to ensure that we made the best of our limited time with the material. So Monday mornings at 9 a.m., we gather in our large workspace, maintaining at least six feet of distance, our faces fully masked. For me, it has become a great way to start the week and ground myself in what the priorities are for the days ahead. When the January 6th attack on the Capitol had us once again working from home for an unknown amount of time, we went right back into our virtual check-ins. Whether it was virtually or in person, every meeting always began with that crucial question, how are you doing? During those 18 weeks of maximum telework, we were making it up as we went along. The three things that helped the most at the outset were to take stock, use what we had, and to be creative. But the biggest takeaway for us was learning how to let go of our best laid plans. We would carefully craft workflows only to have to rework them almost immediately. We made detailed timelines for tasks only to have to revise them in the face of the continuing challenges of the pandemic or situations like the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Working initially with only inventories, we made certain assumptions about how the material would be organized. Even after our months of learning about Stevens, our assumptions proved wrong and we had to reconfigure our plans for some of the identified series. It was incredibly helpful to have the opportunity to really learn about the project, the shape it could take, and how to integrate different archival approaches. But there's no substitute for working with the materials themselves and what can be learned from working with the collection ultimately 
is what dictates how the material is organized. Of course, we were able to jump right back into dealing with the material on site because Stevens was fresh in our minds thanks to our pandemic check-ins. The weekly meetings made us feel like we actually were a team. And I gained a sense of the team members' personalities and their strengths, which Morgan and I used to plan project assignments to make the best use of everybody's time. The meetings created a group that would never have happened if we had jumped right into the project in March 2020. We developed trust and respect through our shared COVID related tribulations, be they the tedium of working from home or the worry of getting infected. For me personally, our meetings just kept me focused on the work. It still felt normal to get dressed and be available and accountable. It was nice to talk out how, talk out how I was feeling to someone. Sometimes the Stevens team would be the only ones who asked me the question, how are you doing? Especially with going through all of the hard things that happened during that time. For that hour, I wasn't a mother, a daughter, or a mate. I was someone that got to focus and really ask myself, how are you doing, ma'am? Even if for a minute. It was also a constant self-check for me that I probably wouldn't have taken time out to do for myself. Getting to know each other better made asking questions easier. And the time spent meetings in the virtual world translated into stronger relationships, working together on site. It was something we hadn't anticipated, but became key to making major headway in processing this collection. Now, when able to work without interruption, 70% of the team's time is spent on site. We are still processing the Stevens papers, working through the various interruptions as they come. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. This final slide has our contact information. We look forward to your questions, but if there's anything we can't get to, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Wow, thank you so much for those presentations. They were fantastic. It was so interesting to see the themes um, going through each of the different presentations. Um, so first I wanna uh, thank y'all for, for hanging in there with me with all of my, uh, my audio woes. Um, but we've got representatives, not just from the Library of Congress, but from some of the other presentations. And I know, you know, that was an hour filled with um, different topics and locations. And I wonder if we couldn't have the presenters that are present uh, on the call, maybe identify yourselves through the chat, maybe jog our, jog our memories on what institution um, y'all were from. Feel free to unmute if you can't. Can you all unmute? Um, I, okay, unmuting yourselves um, and just identify and, and remind us of what group you were with and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Let's see. Okay, can y'all unmute now? Yes. yes. Okay. I can unmute. Thank you. Oh boy, it's been a day, y'all. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me. <laughs> it's been a week, so honestly. It has been a week. <laughs> Okay, so we've got people jumping in on the chat. Any questions? So glad you guys are here. This is wonderful. Uh, I actually have a question. Hi, this is this is Morgan um, from the Library of Congress, and I have a question for Zach. I was fascinated by 
the idea of taking <laughs> collections home to process them. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the criteria that went into selecting like which ones got taken home and which ones you were sort of like, no, we, we definitely cannot take those home. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, so mainly the, uh, the collections that we uh, decided to bring home, these were mostly uh, collections that had not been touched for a long time. Like they had been, uh, they had been accessioned like either, like maybe years before. Um, and we just hadn't gotten to processing them either for various reasons, either they were maybe too big or too disorganized. And um, this way, um, by bringing them home, it actually gave us, um, it gave us a chance to actually um, get into these collections to organize them because we were given so much time. Um, but yeah, as far as like a criteria, we didn't want uh, to bring collection because we didn't know how long we were going to be out for. So we didn't want to bring collections that were uh, really, really large. I mean, like hundreds of boxes. I mean, we didn't have collections that were that huge, but, um, um, but yeah, I mean, just like reasonable amount, a reasonable size so that if, if we had to be out for like a month or two months or whatever, that this would keep us busy for uh, for a little while. But overall, yeah, it was mainly collections that had been that were not processed or hadn't been processed for a while. And we have a question from Christy. Um, it was great to hear how the Library of Congress team got closer, even though they weren't able to see each other in person. Did other groups find this happen as well? And how can we continue to build those work relationships as things, quote, get back to normal? Hi, it's Kate from the Navy. I'll take a stab at this. Um, so I started the day they sent everyone home. And so it was really, like I mentioned, it was really helpful to have those team meetings. It was really helpful um, to have those check-ins. We do uh, a daily check-in in the morning uh, of just, you know, good morning, how are you? Kind of uh, really quickly via Teams. Uh, sometimes throughout the day, people like, you know, make jokes or <laughs> make comments. Uh, the LOC team was talking about VPN. I too share <laughs> the VPN struggle. Um, so just, you know, having just someone to vent uh, to of like, this isn't working, why isn't this working? Uh, why can't I log on to the share drive? Why is an email sending? Um, just having not being able to walk down the hall and having that ability to share that frustration. Uh, so it's nice to have that virtual environment to share that frustration with someone. I just want to say a huge, huge shout I'm sorry, Zach, I'll, I'll be done in a second, but like huge shout out to Kay for starting first day of work on the first day of the pandemic shut down because like, ouch, um, <laughs> I didn't even want to think about that. It's very happy to be settled in my position at the time. So just like, okay, man. <laughs> um, oh yeah, all I was just going to say is what's kind of interesting about um, being at home and uh, communicating with others. Yeah, I think in, in many ways, I think we were able to like get closer together. We, uh, at least with my team, we had um, weekly uh, meetings talking about, and we're, we're, and we've, we're doing this now in, in uh, since we're in the office. Uh, we have like weekly meetings talking about like what projects we're doing and such, and kind of give us an idea, a better idea of uh, what everybody was working on, what, uh, any what people needed um, as far as like resources and such. What's also interesting is that during the pandemic, I think it also brought a lot of like archivists from different institutions together because there were a couple of uh, times where certainly like Louisiana archivists, we actually would get together and talk about um, some of the things that we were doing um, or some of the things that we were not doing and um, giving like uh, giving ideas about uh, how we can uh, better use our time uh, at home. Uh, and just, sorry, just briefly to answer uh, uh, Mr. Olmos's question, he's saying, like, are you all back in the office or is it still hybrid on some days? Um, 
for my for my institution, we are all my my whole staff is back in the office. And in fact, we've actually when uh, when our university reopened, uh, my whole staff, uh, which is only like six uh, individuals, uh, we all decided to uh, that it was worth uh, going back. Um, not saying that the processing at home didn't uh, didn't work or anything, but for us, it just was a lot easier to actually be on site and also to uh, um, to serve patrons as well. But yeah, we're all back. And now our entire library is uh, is back uh, working. Um, I should, for context, I'm gonna also answer that question. Uh, our university just went back to full time. Uh, no one can work from home on May 10th. So uh, my supervisor, our head archivist is, um, within um, some of the danger zones for COVID. So she was working from home a lot longer than I was. I went back to work um, over the summer, uh, last summer, not this summer. Um, but yeah, so it was it was me only for a while there. But for context, um, at least Zach and I are both in Louisiana. So I don't know what other states are, are seeing different things. So I know it's been a different timeline, especially with the federal stuff um, has been very different. So that's a good question, um, David. At the Library of Congress, we um, are going back, I guess I could put, oh, my camera is on. At the Library of Congress, we're back. And um, I've been working full time since September. I'm the only one of the team that is here full time. Other people, um, Melissa is only in two days a week, Monica's in three days a week, and Morgan's in four days a week. We've, um, we still have most of the same restrictions, although as of this morning, we can start not wearing masks, depending on all kinds of things, but we're all mostly still wearing them. But we're not, um, the library itself is only starting to open for researchers at the beginning of June, and our staffing is still very limited um, I think they're only adding 5% more of the staff. So we're still very low on our physical census here in the building. But we're together, as, as we said in the presentation, we're about 70% FTE on site, but not all of us. All of us are together only, I think, one, maybe two days a week, the three of us, four of us. Well, any other questions out there? So interesting to see how all the states are so different. <laughs> What's happened at UNLV? Did you get your staffing back up after, after the budget cuts and things? Um, no, we have not. <laughs> we actually, we've had quite a number of more people, additional people have left, um, and we are still under a hiring freeze. So hopefully in the next fiscal year, starting in July, we'll be able to hire more people, but still quite short staffed over here. So that's put a real um, crimp in your ability to accomplish things. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's a shame. You've had that material a long time. I know. <laughs> We're trying our best. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, I'm, I'm sympathizing. That's, yeah. that's really a shame. We have a question about the workflow charts. Um, and instead of me fumbling through the video, because <laughs> all bets are off today, um, I will tell you that um, probably within an hour, 90 minutes, this will be available in the on-demand section in uh, the hub. So feel free to go back and take a look and um, hopefully that, that would solve your question, David, perhaps. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, I see some people jump in ship. So I'll give you maybe a few more minutes of your day. Um, I wanna thank you, all of the presenters for, I think the most, uh, um, the coolest part of these was you're able to take such a mess and crystallize it into the challenges and successes that you had. I mean, that was a year's worth of, of stuff. Um, so thank you so much for uh, sharing all of your lessons with us. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we'll have this available on demand uh, as soon as I can get it uploaded. And, um, and so, yes, please join me in a round of applause for everybody. Thank you, thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda in 15 minutes will be the um, last round of vendor times with everybody. So if you weren't able to visit with our wonderful, generous vendors, um, please do so today. We've got from 3 to 3.30. Uh, and then one last round of educational sessions from 3.30 to 5. And we all know that's a tough spot to be in. So if you can hang around and support those folks, that would be fantastic. So thank you so much again, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks.